Pete, uh, I just emailed you the list of the council and staff members that are on the line. And it's 530. Okay, I just missed taking a minute, but um, there we go. All right. Um, welcome, and I'd like to say hello. This is the Finance Chair Kate Fields, Fourth Ward Council Person. I'd like to welcome you to Flint City Council Budget Corner Session. Corner of order. Corner of order. The purpose, the purpose of this session corner, is to discuss of order. your needs. Mr. Mays, point there is a point of order. order. And if you be quiet, you're out of order, Mr. Mays. The purpose of this session is to discuss the point of order is Mays. always in order. Point of order. Mr. I'll Mays, kill the ruling of the chair. This is your first warning, Mr. Mays. You are out of order. I'm appealing the ruling. There is no point of order or point of information. You got to have now, some I order like, in a meeting. I would like to, Mr. Mays, keep you in this meeting. You need to be quiet until I finish reading what I'm going to read. Listen, though, to a minute, President Delaware. This is, I never seen nothing like it. All right, Mr. Mays, I'm so sorry to lose you so early in the meeting. Please mute, Mr. Mays. No, you can't. Don't don't mute me, Alma Davina. We got a point of order. Don't mute me. That's right. The purpose of this session is to discuss Mayor Neely's. I'm going to say this to council one time, and anyone who keeps blurting out is going to get a warning. I would like you to allow me to finish reading. Point what I want to read here, and you're out of order, Miss Galloway. I think that's Miss Galloway. If you will just have Call a bit of patience. All right, you're out of order, Miss Galloway. Davina, please remove Miss Galloway. You can't, you can't please move her. Order. Order. I, 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 I appeal that ruling. Davina? And I'll second his yes, appeal. One second. Davina, have you mute, muted Mr. Mays and Ms. Galloway? Point Council of order. Fields. And Ms. Almost. Winfrey Carter supported it. Ms. Fields, if you're going to run a lawless meeting, you need to tell us how the, the proper order of this meeting is. A point of order is in order. Is. A point of order is in order. I'm trying to, but you're not allowing me to. You are interrupting this meeting before it's even really begun. And I was going to explain all that. But, Dedina, are you on the line? Yes, they have been muted. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to continue. And for the rest of council, if you'll have some patience, allow me to read what I have prepared. And by the way, the people who have been muted can still listen to the meeting. Okay? The purpose of this session is to discuss Mayor Neely's proposed fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 21-22 budget. My hope is that this will be an informative, professional, pleasant, and effective session. This session, there are no rules for budget departmental hearings, which this is a form of that, this budget session. There are no written rules. So the I would first like to have a moment of silence for all the people who have passed away due to COVID-19 and other issues, um, especially noting that we have lost two City Hall employees who will be greatly missed. You know, this session can be followed and or heard by going online to www.youtube.com slash user slash spectacle TV. Then I would like to acknowledge who is currently on the line with us. City council persons are, and I would ask you to identify yourself starting with I, uh, Ward 1, unfortunately has already been removed, with the second ward. Maurice Davis. Are you okay, third ward? Fancy Noguera. Uh, fifth ward? 
Jerry Winfrey Carter. Seventh ward has unfortunately been muted. Um, let's see, eighth ward, excuse me, Dinah is six. Is six yes. ward on? Yes, Councilman Winfrey. Thank you. Um, eighth ward? Present, Griggs. Ninth ward? Eva Worthing. Thank you. And from the administration, as I understand it, we have Mr. Edwards. Are you there, Mr. Edwards? Yes, I am. Uh, Ms. Trujillo? I am here. Mr. Benzik? I am present. Thank you. And uh, Stacy, I'm used to Bassey, but Stacy Kate? Yes. Present. Jack. How do you it's say cake. that, Stacy? It's cake like the food. Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to read the Disorderly Persons Ordinance 31-10, which will be in effect during this session. Any person violating this ordinance will be given one warning and, if necessary, will then be muted and unable to participate in the session. Any person that persists in disrupting this meeting will be in violation of Flint City Code Section 31-10, Disorderly Conduct, Assault, and Battery, and Disorderly Persons and will be subject to arrest for a misdemeanor. Any person who prevents the peaceful and orderly conduct of any meeting will be given one warning. If they persist in disrupting the meeting, that individual will be subject to arrest. Violators shall be removed from meetings. I'm now going to read the eight submitted public comments, and then I will explain the meeting parameters. The cutoff time for submitted comments online was 520. Any comments submitted after this point in time will be read at the next council meeting. The first council comment is from Jennifer DeBuck, who says, Can someone on council please explain who we call or email for blight, neighborhood cleanup, and cars illegally parked in front yards help? We have tried to reach Duval Murdoch to no avail. Are there ward-specific neighborhood officers anymore? An updated list and contact info on the city website and Facebook would be helpful. Please advise Jen DeBuck. The next comment is from Amber Jacobs. The comment is, I'd like to highlight a major concern. Why is Angela Wheeler and the city's legal department ignoring and or blocking Freedom of Information Act requests? Don't try to blame Corona. This has been an issue since the Weaver administration took office in 2015. But the new so-called Truth and Transparency, His Honor, claimed he was going to be an open book. Need I remind the council and the longtime city attorney, Angela Wheeler, the act contains a provision legally requiring a is to respond to FOIA requests within 20 days. I speak on good authority that FOIA requests in the city attorney's place of residence, Grand Blank, are all responded to within seven days. The next comment is from Joseph King, who says, to Flint City Council, from Joseph King, Vice President of Ethics and Accountability Board for City of Flint. After reviewing the proposed city budget for the year 2020 and 2021, I am concerned about the recommendation to cut the ombudsperson's budget and remind the council that the city charter mandate that the ombudsperson office should receive a minimum of $250,000 per year. I am fullest aware that this budget is not council budget. I just don't want to see this slip by everyone. I am convinced, just as you have worked with the EBA board since we was appointed, that you would continue to support and uphold the charter that was voted on by the resident of this city who also voted for each of you to carry out their wish. I am also concerned about the hiring of infirm by City of Flint that would recommend to the city to disregard a mandate of the charter. Thank you for your time. Joe King, second ward. EAB Vice Chairman. The next one is from Tanya Dorsey, the ombudsperson to City Council, date May 
19th, 2020, regarding 2020-2021 budget. As the appointed ombudsperson for the City of Flint, I am tasked with assisting residents with complaints regarding civil services or civil servants. The Charter has prescribed many requirements for the office of the ombudsperson. In order to fulfill the duties as prescribed, the City of Flint Charter mandates that the office of the ombudsperson be given a minimum budget in the amount of $250,000. I request that City Council not approve a budget that funds the office of the ombudsperson less than the $250,000 as mandated in the City of Flint Charter. I would like to put my concern on the record regarding the City of Flint's potential removal of funds that would put the operating budget under the Charter's $250,000 mandate. I request that Council not approve a budget that takes the operating budget for the office of the ombudsperson below the charter mandated two hundred and fifty thousand. Thank you for your time and consideration. Connie L. Dorsey, Ombudsperson. Next. Uh, from Tamara Robinson, Mayor Neely and City Council. Another viral national news story this week because of more violent crime at a Flint liquor store. All the comments on Facebook mock us, calling Flint hopeless, full of nothing but party stores, blight, crime, and dysfunctional government. This is our reputation. And then it cites a uh, headline, Flight at Flint Liquor Store Leaves Shoppers Shot After Security Guard Enforces Capacity Rules. Front page of the Detroit Free Press. It then has the um, internet link to that story. These millionaire party store owners prey on Flint hopelessness. Shut some of these stores down, limit their hours to 9 p.m., find them for litter, ticket them for loitering, stop rubber stamping license transfers. Do something, please. Cameron Robinson, Second Ward. And then here's another one from um, Pastor Alan Gilbert. To President Galloway, Vice President Davis, and Councilwoman Fields, as well as the entire city council, I want to express my alarm at the proposed 2020-21 recommended budget. The Ombudsperson Department 290.100 budget is cut $142,845. The Charter mandates a $250,000 budget for this office. I want to encourage the City Council to uphold the Charter. The EAB supports the City Council in correcting this recommended violation. The City of Flint website has a recommended budget at $107,155. For this reason, the recommended budget should not be approved by the City Council. God bless and be safe, Ward 7, EAD Chair, Pastor Alan Gilbert. And then the last one. No, a couple more. From Kim Brown, Dear City of Flint, we'd just like to thank Robert Benzik and Betty Weidman and their crew for their assistance with the neighborhood issue in Ward 8. We note the Public Works Department tends to get a lot of flack. But in our experience, they've been empathetic, prompt, and professional in resolving an issue and elevating the safety of our neighborhood. Kim Brown, Ward 8. And then the last one is from Ethics and Accountability Board member, Lois Driscoll. Public speaking comments for City Council meeting being held by video conferencing on May 19, 2020, being submitted to City Clerk Inez Brown. As an appointed member of the Ethics and Accountability Board member by the former Honorable Dr. Karen Weaver, I would like to make a public comment to the Flint City Council as a whole. As the former chair of the Ethics and Accountability Board, we have tried to gain the respect of the City Council and new mayoral administration almost to no avail. Due to the pandemic, we find ourselves once again coming up on the short end of the stick during the budget process with the Neely administration. We have met with Mayor Neely and were told that the previous resolution that was voted unanimously by the City Council in 2019, awarding the Ethics and Accountability Board $50,000, had been shredded, which was a lie. Any action of that kind would speak to the lack of integrity of the clerk's office, which we knew was untrue, 
but again, was an attempt to not fund or address our needs. We have been lied to, given the runaround, forced to operate out of a one-man office for months, and moved more times than I want to mention. This lack of respect for the office of the ombudsperson is indicative of the value this administration has for the citizens in the city of Flint. None of you or the mayor-elect would be in power if it was not for the citizens of the city of Flint, and we intend to remind the citizens at every opportunity, especially during an election year. This board was created by the citizens to protect any injustices that they perceive occurring. It is apparent that the administration, once in office, has abandoned the very citizens that elected him to that position. How are we to protect the citizens if this city council does not ensure that we have the funding to do an effective job? Pandemic or not, this board is here to stay and needs to be a priority for the city council before any budget is approved. The new charter is allocated $250,000 annually as a minimum budget. And at the very least, we request that the city council not pass any budget that does not include that amount, preferably more. Your actions are being viewed by the world and will reflect the value you place on the citizens of Flint. Respectfully yours, Lois Driscoll, EAB member. Okay, now... I would like to read about the parameters of this session. Number one, this is just a budget session. It is not a special council meeting, nor it is a regular council meeting, nor is it a committee meeting. There are no rules. Excuse me, um, Councilwoman Field? Yes, Ms. Winfrey Carter? Um, before you get into that, I would like I would like to say something. I would like to could, could you wait until I reach this and then I will give you the floor, Miss Winfrey Carter. Go ahead, Councilwoman Fields. Thank you. As soon as you finish, I would like to have the floor. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Parameters of this session. The session begins at five thirty PM and ends at seven thirty PM promptly. There is no official roll call and a quorum is not necessary for this session. There is no official cold order of the session. There is no set agenda, therefore there are no changes or additions to same. There will be no referrals or motions. Although council staff are facilitating this session, they are not set up to take minutes or votes. Due to the governor's executive orders for virtual gatherings of legislative bodies due, during the pandemic, there will be public comments, but no council response. This session is otherwise similar to the departmental budget hearings council has always held. There will be no points of order or points of information. If any council person wishes to be recognized, please just say your name and you will have that opportunity. All council persons are expected to stay on task and on topic. Any other discussion will be considered out of order and the violator will be given one warning. Further or continued digressions by any council person will result in that council person being muted and removed from participation in the session. We will begin by going in rounds of three minutes each of speaking, starting with Ward 9 and going backwards to Ward 1. If you wish, you may respond to public speakers during your first round. If after this session you still have additional questions, you may A, submit your written questions to the finance chair, and those questions will then be forwarded to the administration for written answers, and or B, request additional time on the next council meeting of Tuesday, May 26th to discuss your concerns and or questions. Adoption of a budget, whether amended or as proposed, will occur on Monday, June 1st, as required by the city charter. So before I let uh, Ms. Worthing of Ninth Ward, I have her first three minutes. Uh, Ms. Winfrey Carter, you had something you wish to say? Yes. Now, you know what? I think, and, I, and, and, and you need to be fair, um, Councilwoman Field. I think you need to uh, let Councilwoman Galloway and Councilman Mays back onto this meeting. You did not give them a fair chance. And if you're not going to do it, I'm going to appeal your ruling. Because based on our city council rules, a point of order is always 
it is always recognized. And you ignore their point of order. And that's not right. Are you telling me? Okay, I'll respond to that. Unfortunately, neither Ms. Galloway nor Mr. Mays were willing to just even hold their comments until I could finish reading this. And I have just explained to you, I am being actually very fair. This is being held just there are no rules for a budget session. I'm going to appeal it. Yeah, there's no ruling. There, There is no point of order or point of information in a budget hearing. A point of not, order. A point of order. Ms. Lindsay, it is not covered order. in our council rules. Now, you are out of order, and I would like very much for you to stay you know what? on the you line and be able to participate. I'm off. I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, now we'll start with Ms. Worthing. Do you have any comments? You have three minutes, Ms. Worthing. Uh, my only comments um, right now, and then I'll have questions later uh, for the budget, but is it's unfortunate that we have members that just cannot follow the rules. I, you know, for um, Mays to just immediately come in and call a point of order, and nothing has been done yet. It's just a chance to get the floor and take control um, and distract. And I applaud you, Ms. Fields, for allowing the rest of us who want to get work done to get it done uh, and not have to go through endless points of orders and points of information, especially when they're not even relevant in, in a finance budget meeting. And it's also unfortunate that Ms. Winfrey Carter didn't understand that after you read those rules. We've, we've had this problem before during budget meetings with others not understanding. It's not a council meeting, <clears throat> but I would um, encourage the rest of us that are here, um, let's get some work done. And that's all for now. Thank you. And uh, excuse me for just a moment, um, Mr. Griggs, before you start, uh, you know, can, can you possibly time this? I can't both talk in time. And tell me when three minutes are up, if necessary. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, next is Ward 8. That's Mr. Griggs. Mr. Griggs? Yes, uh, this is to Mr. King, Ms. Dorsey, and Mr. Gilbert. Uh, I'm not quite sure why the ombuds uh, or the ethics and accountability uh, board was cut from 250000 annual down. I'm sure we'll be able to resolve this uh, this evening uh, since our administration is present for this meeting. So please bear with us while we try to figure out what's going on. And I fully support, you know, you getting 250000 a year for the Ethics and Accountability Board. Uh, the extra fifty to sixty thousand, and I think that that you're wanting, I'm not quite positive on what that is, but I think we can get through this without uh, dragging down the present administration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Um, that would be Mr. Winfrey. Herb Winfrey, Dick Ward. Mr. Winfrey, are you there? Yes, ma'am. To the lady that, that talked about uh, or that mentioned the the stores that are open and all of the violence that takes place, I do think she's right. We we do need to to clamp down on that if, on that that kind of behavior because it affects the folks that are in that area and our city as well. So I will be talking to uh, the city administrator and others to see what we can do about that because I've been getting some complaints in my ward as well. And then um, lastly, uh, finance chair, uh, I, I too believe that there should be order in meetings, but I've been on the council now a little bit more than five years and I've never been in a meeting where a point of order was not recognized. 
and was not a part of the the uh, the meeting. And if there is an appeal, I think the point of order and the appeal should be recognized. And I've never been in a meeting uh, like that, and I've never been in a meeting where we can just make the rules as we go. I missed why Councilwoman Galloway and Councilman Mays uh, were dismissed from the meeting. But if it's what I think, I would just I would like to say that I, I think a point of order is always, regardless of what kind of meeting, we've got to have some order. As you have said, and I agree, you got to have some order in a meeting. But how do we get the floor and get our thoughts out if we don't use the point of order and the point of information? And according to what I've read, it's supposed to be recognized. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you're welcome. Um, we do not have fifth and seventh board on the line, so um, I will just respond. I'll say, Mr. Winfrey, um, I will make a point of contacting you after this meeting uh, to discuss the issue you just brought up, but uh, I want to tell you that um, this has been thoroughly researched. There are no rules for a budget session. Uh, it's like a departmental hearing, so it is not a meeting, and we don't follow meeting rules for this. So, um, you know, I will discuss it with you in depth after this, uh, hopefully to your satisfaction. So I'm not ignoring your concern. Um, I just would like to move ahead with the topic I can so we can make the most of having uh, the administration here to help answer any questions or concerns. Okay, Mr. Guerrero, third ward. Yeah, I got nothing to say at this time. Okay, Mr. Davis, second ward. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fields. I like to say this. I'm looking forward to this budget hearing because there's so much business that needs to be done at this time. But fires that the caller with that liquor store second shooting uh, incident, I should say. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm very frustrated how the liquor store is able to function when other businesses, all businesses need to be open. But why are they open after 9 p.m.? People not buying toilet paper. They're getting liquor and everything else, and they just uh, lottering around them stores. They trifling how they keep their parking lot up. They're a blight to the neighborhood. I'm about ready to get with Mr. Clyde and whoever over blight, as well as NSO officers, as well as Chief Hart. All of them folks need to be shut down if that's what they're going to do to this community. All of them liquor stores, it needs to be a fair warning right across the board. Blight is blight, and these liquor stores ain't nothing but blight in a, a, a impoverished neighborhood. And it's very frustrating because not a, a lot of our crime begins at these old liquor stores with these folks standing around and then no safe distancing. No mass, and they're doing everything against what we're trying to do in this city. If we're going to turn it around, let's start with these liquor stores immediately. Thank you for indulging. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Okay, for our second round, back to Ms. Worthing. Do you have a question of the administration or something you would like to talk about pertaining to the proposed budget? Ms. Worthing? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Um, I did actually have a a question about street lighting, and I don't know if it's really an actual budget question, but um, our can it can it be explained? Can it be explained again which lights are covered and which aren't? I think our uh, street lighting was increased last year, and also um, if you own a vacant lot or you own a lot that doesn't have a home on it, do you? still pay for garbage pickup and street lighting. I've had that question um, asked, and I was just wondering the rules on that as well. Okay. Um, the administration, Mr. Edwards or Mr. Scorsoni or Amanda, who would like to respond? I can respond. This is Amanda. Okay. Um, for vacant lots, um, you do not pay a garbage fee on that, but you can pay a lighting fee. Um, with some vacant lots, you can um, go to assessments and have that vacant lot combined with your main lot, and then that way you wouldn't be subject to having the lighting fee on that on the vacant lot parcel anymore because you can combine that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
All right. Um, Mr. Griggs, you're next. Was, was that all, Ms. Worthing? Yes, for now. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Griggs, you're next. Do you have additional something you'd like oh. to ask or comment on? Or Yeah. Uh, I forgot to mention Ms. Kim Brown. Uh, thank you for your uh, compliments to the Public Works Department. And I agree with you about the convenience stores. I think they should close at 9 o'clock to be in line with the mayor's 9 o'clock curfew. Uh, as In regards to street lighting, there was a stabbing in the parking lot of Eisenhower Grade School a while back at night. And it's because there's no nightlight in the back uh, backside of Eisenhower in the parking lot. So hopefully you can get that covered while we discuss lighting in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griggs. Uh, Mr. Winfrey. Thank you. Uh, my question is, I know I've read the charter and the charter does uh, uh, mention that the ombudsman's office would be we would fund the ombudsman, ombudsman's office for $250,000. And I would like for someone from the administration to tell me why that's how we can change that without changing the charter. Um, We'd like Mr. to return. Right. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we uh, recognize that. Um, we should have budgeted more for the ombuds office. Um, it was just an oversight on our part. So we would recommend um, the city council amend the budget uh, of the ombuds person, and we can give you the exact figures that uh, would be broken down by different categories um, so that it matches the 250000 Thank you, Mr. Scarsoni. Yep. More questions, Mr. Winfrey? No, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. When I asked then, Mr. Uh, Scorsoni, we, we are not doing um, regular referrals for this, but um, I guess what I'm hearing is that you will send perhaps to all of council, uh, ensuring that the clerk's office gets a copy of what that amount would be. So um, council can make that motion when they vote on um, the budget on June 1st? That is correct, yes. Perhaps you could have that prior to the next council meeting, which is on the 26th. That would be appreciated. Yeah, yeah we'll get it to you this week, yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have a quick question because any changes that council proposes to make um, we have to say where the, if we're saying where money's going to, we have to say where money's coming from. So where are you thinking that the balance of to me and it, if I remember correctly, I may be a little off, but it's something to the tune of 140,000 and change. Where would this money be coming from? Do you think? Um, I'll have to look into that, and I'll provide that information as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Guerrera, do you have any comments, questions? Yeah, yeah one of my, my questions was answered by Mr. Winfrey's question, too. I was concerned about uh, the oversight, but I'm glad to hear that we can get an answer for the ombudsman. Um, correct funding. Uh, with just a quick question, do we plan on seeing any any layoffs or anything like that by any department? Would someone like to respond? Mr. Edwards, Mr. Sports, only someone? Hello? Yeah. Yes, yes, I'm here. I, I, um, would, I, would, say, whoever, I would say... Excuse me, Mr. Edwards, uh, is that you that has music in background? No, ma'am. No. Okay. Thank you. Proceed. Yeah, I would say that you, this budget was put forth with the intent not to have layoffs, 
um, and to try to keep the budget in alignment with that um, process. However, we're very much aware that uh, uh, from council standpoint. Mr. Edwards, I'm so sorry to interrupt you once again, but someone needs to mute themselves. They have music going uh, on the phone, and it's difficult to hear. So I don't know who it is, but okay, it's it's quiet now. I'm sorry, Mr. Edwards. Please proceed. No problem. Yeah, it, it, it's our, it was our intent in the budget to try to ensure that uh, we maintain staffing in all positions and that we would not have to proceed in that direction. However, we are uh, aware that changes might be made um, with city council. So uh, I really couldn't, you know, at this point, I, the administration probably couldn't give you a definitive answer because we will need to see uh, a final budget and be able to know what we're, what has been passed and ultimately uh, what we'll be working with. Okay, Mr. Greer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't have no other question other than what already been brought up about you know, Mr. Busman. Upholding the charter is very important. That's the constitution of the city, and by all means, whatever, by any means necessary, we want to make sure we uphold this charter. It all means we we must uphold this charter. And if it calls for that 250, whatever we need to do to button down to make sure that happens, as long as all hands on deck and we know what kind of situation we're dealing with, I hope we can make sure we uphold our end of that charter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll take a, a turn on this round. Um, could you tell me, um, uh, Chief Hart or Mr. Scorsoni or anyone, but, um, are we going to be able to maintain our uh, current level of staffing with the police department? And do we currently have unfilled positions that are in the budget, but we just haven't filled them yet? This, this is uh, Chief Hart. Uh, we do have uh, some positions that are within the budget that have not been filled. There are uh, 16 positions. We've also had three people that have uh, retired over the last month. So we're totally uh, down by 19 at this point. The budget that is being proposed does allow for us to pick up those numbers. Um, so is, is if we stay where we are, then yes, we will be able to, and I'm working, um, interviewing people constantly looking for candidates. Okay, thank you. And I don't know if uh, Chief Barton is on the line. Could he comment to the same question about the uh, staffing of the fire department or someone? Yeah. Yes, that's Chief Barton. I'm on the line. Uh, we actually um, are in the same position as, as Chief Hart. We um, are currently down four positions just in the last uh, week. I ha the last month, I have one person leave and go to another department. Um, as we always say, Flint is kind of a training hub. People come here. And they can leave. We had a firefighter um, leave for a substantial raise, but and we had a retirement, and, and two guys resign. And we're currently looking at if some guys on that have applied, so it's a possibility I could lose three or four more positions to other fire departments. But currently, the budget is uh, as so to keep us mandated at 83 where we were at when the uh, budget is proposed. And so at that point, we would have to hire. But during with the COVID. And being able to do the testing and get those procedures done, we got to uh, find a way that we can test and hopefully we can hire people this summer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gainey, to you, um, same question regarding street maintenance and fleet. Are you there, Mr. Daly? Um, okay, Rob, uh, I was going to ask you next for DPW anyway, so go ahead. Yes, I think uh, across the board, the, the budget, um, at least in DPW, looks to kind of stand pat on staffing. 
Um, but we are aware there, there could, you know, there might have to be some adjustments made. But as of now, the budget that's in front of you, I think, is for everybody to, to stand pat on their staffing. Okay, and can you tell me, have we filled those positions that had, were posted? I, I believe we have a hiring freeze right now, but at the water treatment plant and water pollution control, do we have any openings that we've not filled? We have. Uh, and I think that's a good Yeah, we have some openings, um, I think, across the board in the utility. So I think there's, there's some openings at the water service center, uh, wastewater plant, and the water plant. Do you know how many? I don't know exactly how it is, but there is a there is currently a hiring freeze. So, um, but there's, I mean, there's sev I know there's several openings at the water service center. I think just the water department alone has approximately uh, 13 vacancies, so it's, it's significant. Okay. Um, I know that the city clerk is not on the line, but the deputy clerk, uh, Davina Donahue, um, is on the line. Um, Davina, do you know, and can anyone tell me, um, I believe we have openings, um, postings for council staff. Do you know if there are any others in the clerk's office? No, I um, don't know. I think uh, and again, I can't really speak for the clerk, but I think that they were trying to make some part-time um, people full-time. That's all that I know of, but I don't know of any openings, though. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Edwards, I do believe that we had posted, and I'm not sure how this hiring freeze affects all of this, but we had posted certainly a position to fill um, Davina's previous position, now that she's deputy clerk, uh, and I think we are even supposed to get yet another position. Do you know if any of those are posted? Uh, no, are I don't. Uh, no, no, I don't um, know at this time. I don't know if Charlie is on the on the line. Uh, uh, Charlie McClendon is Charlie on the line? Okay. That that's uh, I can get you that information. I can make a determination and find out and get you the appropriate information. Okay. okay. And can you explain to me how the hiring freeze affects positions that are open and have already been posted? Does that mean we're not hiring anyone, or are there essential jobs that we're still hiring for? And are yeah, they all, and are any of these positions in the in this current budget? Okay, the first well, the first part of that is that uh, from the hiring freeze itself, uh, it, it it is the you know mayor's intent, administration's intent that right now as we try to stabilize city government, uh, and as we looked at the budget, uh, that's how that came about in terms of of of, of not looking and hires at this time. Uh, but ultimately, you do have some critical areas uh, like police and fire and uh, DPW aspects that uh, cannot be um, postponed, so to speak, those job positions. And so in certain circumstances, on a case-by-case -case basis, of looking at the critical need for that particular position. Okay. Well, I personally would might like to take an appeal because I know how much work centers around the council office because without the ability to take minutes, transcribe them, et cetera, we can't even meet our legal FOIA obligations. So would you say the administration considers at least the, uh, the one position of council staff critical? And is that in the budget? I, I would I would say that that matter can be explored and we can look at um, you know, whether that's available budgetary wise first and then um, from that proceed if it you know in terms of I understand it is an important so I don't want to make it you know out that it's uh, not critical so I'm saying that we can look at it 
uh, make a determination, uh, make sure the, the, the monetary dollars are there to fulfill that request, and uh, then work to get the approval from the mayor. Okay. Is Mr. Scorsoni there? Maybe he could answer whether it is currently in the budget or not, that, that at least that one position to the council office. Yes, it is in the budget. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Edwards, I guess the dis further discussion is just whether the administration considers that essential <laughs> regarding the hiring. I guess there'll be additional conversations about that. Yes, yes, I would, I would, I would say that it would have to be some additional conversation. That's not a no, but it's just that idea that uh, there have been several appeals. So I'm just, I'll just say it like that. Um, directly to me concerning uh, positions in various areas and the importance of those positions to fulfill the needs uh, in those departments. So, um, and they have been seen uh, as uh, critical needs in those departments um, as a part of the overall City Hall mission and City Hall aspect. Um, that, that's something that has to be reviewed and determined. Okay. Uh, and I'm sorry, I am taking a lot of time, but I'm trying to go through departments. Um, I, I guess the last uh, really essential, I'm aware that Reed Erickson uh, took employment elsewhere. Is Angela Wheeler on the line? Uh, okay, well, does anyone, Mr. Edwards or Mr. Scorsoni, do you know whether we have hired to fill that position and whether that's considered critical? Um, we have not hired this that position at this time. Um, my understanding is that there are other staff taking up those responsibilities. And um, I think it's really, we have to evaluate to see how critical that will be in some time period here. Okay. I, I think if I All may, right. um, if I just may quickly yep. to council, I think, you know, the idea here is simply that we want to, we want to hire critical positions where necessary, but part of doing this freeze is the idea to assess the situation and our financial status, or especially say over the next few months to determine, um, you know, state budget reductions, federal, um, relief for local governments. Um, so I think, you know, that's why we're doing a freeze. It's not that we don't intend to ever fill the position or that we would like, I think all of these positions are critical in some way, but, you know, we need to evaluate the situation uh, to protect the people that are already here for one thing. And so I think just to understand that dynamic, and I would just note, for example, today, that the Federal Reserve Chairman, uh, Jerome Powell, actually made specific mention of local governments being a critical factor in the economic recovery uh, and, and really speaking to Congress about the need to do something. So uh, just, just to understand, we're not, I don't think anyone's saying we don't want to fill these positions. It's just a question of timing. Okay, thank you. Well, I'd like to open up the floor again. Instead of going in a round, um, if council would simply identify themselves by name and I'll recognize you. Any additional questions or concerns? Anyone? Okay, well then, I'll continue to ask a couple more questions if no one else would like the floor first. All right, now I'd like to talk about, and I would I would like to see how council is feeling about the proposed budget that's Madam been presented Chair? to us. Yes, Chair? sir? I'd like yes, to sir. ask something after you're done. Okay, Mr. Griggs, you go first. Oh. No, no, go ahead. I can wait. No, no, because I was going to change to a big topic. You go first, Mr. Griggs. Okay, I... I'm not totally convinced that we're really increasing the budget in our street lighting. I, I've looked at the 
the predicted bu- or the budget for 20 and 21, but I'm not really seeing the increase. I must be missing something. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I just know, you know, I know that we're making, or excuse me, we're not paying as much money as we transition to LED lights. Therefore, we've got to be spending money or we've got to be uh, in industry, they'd be called a cost avoidance. And I know we've got to have a cost avoidance with this new LED lighting. I know the fixtures to begin with uh, may cost more, but I know that our utility has uh, a cost have come down. And I'm just not convinced that we're really increasing our street lighting budget. And I, I don't know if Mr. Scusorni can react or respond to that, but I'm still not convinced that I'm seeing an increase in our street lighting budget. Thank you. Mr. Scusorni, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, so the information I have in front of me, which should be the same thing you have, um, is our 2020 amended budget was uh, for appropriations of 3.13 million, and our appropriations for 2021 recommended budget are 2 mil, uh, 2.834 million. So, as I see it, the budget is down about 200 thousand, roughly. Um, I do wish Suzanne, uh, unfortunately, she had a conflict. There's a a zoning board meeting at the same time um, because she honestly knows a little more detail about this. But um, that was the recommended budget as the board in our discussion. So, yeah, it actually is down about $200,000. That's what I've noticed, and I don't think it should be down. because I know we're saving money with our new LED lighting uh, and uh, utility cost to consumers energy. So mm-hmm. I guess we'll just have to wait till Suzanne gets back on board. Thank you. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll try and look into that for you. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, thank you, Mr. Scorsoni, Mr. Griggs. Um, regarding that topic, I, I wish legal were on the line because I do have a question. We pay for our street lighting and our garbage through assessments. My question is, I have heard that it actually, the, for example, the, the garbage collection, what is being charged to us is actually less than what we are assessing to other people. And if what you were saying right now is true, that the street lighting budget um, is is down by two hundred thousand. Are we still? What's the legality of if we are still assessing for every lot for street lights, but we are actually spending less on street lighting? Where is the legality in that? Uh, this is Angela. Oh, there you are. Hi. Yeah, I'm sorry. I I, I joined late, so. Um, but well, welcome. Sorry, so. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so what are we, what's the question again? Well, Mr. Scorsoni just explained to Mr. Griggs and counsel that the budget on street lighting is down about 200000 And And my question is, we assess per lot for both street lighting and garbage. Okay, where's the legality and don't we need to spend as much as we are assessing? If if we are assessing more than it actually costs us, is that legal? Um, yeah, I have to look into that to see what the state law says on what our maximums are. I don't know, if, Eric, if you if you know if you're familiar with the um, maximums are offhand. Um, I don't. I mean, I'm not, so I can't give you a legal opinion, but I can at least say that generally speaking. With these kind of assessments, you are correct that we should charge what it costs us um, as a rule of accounting, at least. And um, we have reduced. So what we do is we, we're going to provide you with the master fee schedule. Where we do reduce street lighting fees uh, to correspond with what we expect 
to be less spending. Now, the truth is, you know, we go through the year and we, we have a budget, but obviously that budget may be right or wrong. So, I mean, we're doing the best we can. And just as an example, my I just ran a report. I mean, as of today, we have spent, um, we had a budget, as I said, of $3.1 million, but we've actually only spent $2.1 million, um, which is, um, you know, we're 80, what are we, 80 some, 85% through the fiscal year, and we've only spent 66%. So, um, now, I don't know. There may be costs that come in at the end of the year, so I have to be a little careful here because sometimes there's accounting that happens at the, in June. But but at the moment, I mean, it does seem like we're underspending relative to what we expected. And so, you know, it may make sense that we should be then setting rates differently to reflect that reality. Now, I don't know all the details, and Suzanne would know better why we are spending less. I don't know, honestly, but um, but that's, yeah, you're right. I mean, the general rule of thumb is to spend whatever you spend, that's how you set the rates. And But, you know, you can build up some fund balance, too. It's not, it's not unallowed, so that can happen. Okay, thank you, Mr. Scarsoni. I, I think, Angela, although we're not doing formal referral requests during this budget session because we're not equipped to do that, um, I think you get the gist of what I'm asking, and and I would like to understand that better, especially in view towards the more street lights that we change out to LED lighting, as Mr. Griggs has pointed out, the less it's going to cost us to pay for our lighting. So I would like to know how that all works in legally with what we are then assessing people for those services. Okay, I would just say... This is Stacy. Stacy, uh, would you like to be recognized? Yeah. Please. Um, another thing that takes effect with the street lighting is that we do several combos a year. And so that does take down the actual amount of lots and parcels that that number is divided into. So that could be part of it as well. Okay, good point. Council in the field? Yep. Rob. Uh, Rob, so the, yeah. Yeah, the short, I think, I think uh, Eric touched on it. The, the short answer is if, if we're taking in more money um, then what we're spending, there will be a fund balance that will run, um, and then we would adjust. Um, but like Stacy said, there's a number of factors. It's, it's the, kind of the same with garbage as well. Um, we'll often run a small fund balance um, and maybe adjust the fee as we go forward, depending on uh, you know how it looks. So it's, it's kind of a you know, it's kind of a tricky balance there. You're kind of walking you know, walking a fine line to, to not gain fund balance and to, to assess the proper amount to all of the, all the residents. So it, it, it's always changing because the number of residents is always changing and lots and, and addresses and all that thing. So. All right. One thing I would, one thing I would like to add, um, and you guys will probably find this entertaining like I do. So when you deal with that consumers, problem. yes, same, same. Okay. So, so when you deal with consumers on street lighting, you would think that consumers would meter, uh, they have an electric meter for all of the feeds for all the different street lights, yeah. but they don't. Uh, they actually charge you a flat rate, and when, the, when a light is changed out to an LED, they change, they charge you a new lower flat rate. Um, so they've always done it that way. Um, I've had some push um, for traffic signals because traffic signals are done the same way um, as well as, um, you know, we've been in conversation about street lighting as well, but they, they kind of charge a flat, a flat rate and um, they do adjust it as they replace, uh, as we replace signals and or street lights with LEDs, they adjust it down, but we don't get actually metered um, the the true cost of the power. So, you know, we could be less or we could be more. It's it's kind of it's kind of screwed up the way they do it. 
Okay. Well, I guess overall, like I say, there are, you know, many more important things you're dealing with, more immediate things, I should say, not more important, because anytime we're charging a resident taxes and assessments, that's very important to them and to us. But um, I would like to have some sense of the legality of what we can assess, you know, when it and the saving and fund balance versus what it's actually costing us. Um, maybe when you get some free time, Ms. Wheeler, whenever that is, um, uh, you could point me towards some documents that, can help me understand that better. Yeah, let's let's if we can do that. And I would just say so um, we can make sure that we don't mix anything that would be in a meeting. When I say a meeting, I mean a a, a quorum that we would just do that separately so that we can. Um, keep those things separate, but I understand you want, you're looking for stuff for budget, but if we can, you know, keep this to the budget Q&A, I think that would be helpful, but I, I, I did hear what you said, and, and I received that. Okay. Well, um, I and I'm in agreement, but I just think that what we're budgeting is definitely tied into what we're assessing. So, okay, well, um, would anyone else like the floor at this time? Okay, I have a bigger question then, and I would like to hear from council about what their thoughts are on the overall proposed budget, okay, is using uh, a considerable amount of fund balance. And it has been explained to us by Mr. Sporsoni, um that this is largely due to our legacy retirement costs. Okay. I would just like to hear from council what their thoughts are on the use of this fund balance in the proposed budget. Uh, Ms. Fields? Yes, Mr. Davis? Yeah, thank you. I could just say this is just my honest opinion. Right now, times is lean, even with the COVID virus. You know, things happen unforeseen even in your own household, and it get tight. And I feel like this, and I done been broke before, but I survived it. Every night, and it... Whoops. I lost Mr. Davis, Davina. Hey, he's still on? Uh, yeah, he's still showing. Mr. Davis, did you mute yourself? Okay, no, he dropped. I'll unmute him. He dropped. Well, we'll come back to him when he reconnects with us. Okay, let's go Madam on. Is there another Chair. council person? Whoop. Madam Whoop. Finance yes. Chair, Councilman Winfrey. You know, I'm, I'm glad. Winfrey. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm glad to see us address this legacy cost. You know, we've been talking about this legacy cost uh, since I've been on council, and we've been behind in the amount of money that we're paying. And at some point in time, we knew that we were going to have to address it. And so I'm glad to see it's being addressed in this budget. Uh, I, I, I mean, can you imagine if you were a city uh, retiree and you wake up one morning and uh, you you don't get paid? We, we I think this is a good idea. You know, in fact, We've had some discussion in other budget meetings uh, last year when Councilman Mays wanted to move some money for police, and I, I, I wished we had enough money to do that because I didn't think that that was, uh, uh, that was a bad idea. But I was more concerned with the, with the legacy cost that we had seemed to be – seemed to not – I don't want to use the word ignoring, but I knew that we were not – putting in the amount that we should have been putting in. So now, we still may not be, but at least we begin to address it. So I think that's a good thing. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Winfrey. Anyone else? Madam Eva? Yeah. Eva? Yes, Ms. Worthing. Yes. Um, so I went to uh, a finance uh, meeting in Frankenmuth 
not too long ago, and they actually said that our um, general fund was way too large and that most municipalities will have a place to put that. So I'm in agreement. I believe Davis was on the same track as what Mr. Winfrey said, that we actually needed to start dipping into that uh, to start paying some of this uh, and and get on track. I I'd hope that we do have, you know, a general fund after this year, but uh, it was too large. And I'm, I'm glad that we did save up, though, and we were able to do this. So um, good job for council for not uh, spending frivolously. And that's all. Thank you, Ms. Worthing. Anyone else? Yeah, Ms. Phil. Yes, that Mr. Davis there, you are okay. We lost Yeah, my you. phone had dropped. Just when I was okay. just gonna get into it, I thought a decent spill. But anyway, legacy costs, you know, as these retirees retire, it get bigger and bigger and the ones working. But now with this here um pandemic on hand, less people working. The whole United States economy is in trouble. So we just got to just buckle down, and I'm sure that's what the administration doing, as well as with this body, work in one accord and try to make lemonade out of these lemons. I mean, the whole country. We we can't we cannot sustain ourselves working against each other. And that's just common sense. Every household got to buckle down. And, you know, and, and that's just where we're at. We get that brilliant minds on board in the administration. Utilize it. Just know the world have changed. And I don't know how long. I ain't never seen this in my lifetime. But I do know this. If we don't put our all hands on deck and make limbs out of this lemonade budget with the legacy costs and everything else, this is not business as usual. I just hope we continue to just work it out at whatever means necessary. And I thank you, Ms. Fields. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Anyone else? Mr. Yeah, Burr, I do you have like any comments? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to say, too, I agree. That I don't think that uh, the fund balance that we are, we're dipping into is, you know, is just something that we can play with, but it's something that we need to use for important things. And as Mr. Winfrey pointed out, you're right. I couldn't imagine being a retiree. Uh, and one day not get paid. Uh, and we can't, we can't risk that happening. So, um, unfortunately, you know, we have to dip into that balance, but I understand why the administration is doing so. And I support them. Thank you. Mr. Griggs. Mr. Griggs, do you have an opinion or comment? Yeah, I'm just, uh, trying to find the unmute. Um, uh, Mr. Benzik said that we have 13 openings in the water department, and I haven't seen those jobs posted. Is What is the real reason that we're not posting for those 13 jobs? I mean, are we trying to just hold off? Or I really don't understand. I'd, I'd like to know why we're not posting for those 13 jobs, and, and that's to Mr. Benzik. Thanks. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. So, Mr. Bill. Councilman Griggs, the jobs were posted, and we had uh, we had established a list. <clears throat> Excuse me. They went through the first round of uh, testing, and we were right at the point of uh, sending them into uh, the, the physical um, aptitude test, and that's when the COVID virus hit. So we just we, the, we stopped. Um, the recruitment, and really are just waiting uh, until we can somewhat get on the other side of this and, and attempt to fill the position. Okay. I, I guess I understand because I see all the job postings, and I just don't recollect seeing those 13 jobs posted. But, okay, I understand. Thank you. Since the, since the hiring freeze, there's only been – uh, and I, I'm not sure if anybody from HR is here. There's only been very limited postings, um, you know, by, I mean, that's that's the directive that was given out. So um, I think you've just seen a couple of uh, blight officer postings that have come across. And I think with the exception of that, maybe, maybe the HR director position and the CFO position, other than that, there hasn't been anything posted uh, 
for hiring because yeah. there, there has been a directive given for a hiring freeze. Yeah, that is all I've seen posted as those particular jobs you just mentioned. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Griggs, one of the questions I had just posed to all the council people was, do you have any opinion or comment on the proposed budget, which uh, proposes to use fund balance for our legacy costs uh, versus not using fund balance for our legacy costs? I'm, you mean, do I have an opinion on that? Yeah. No, I don't at this time. Thank you, though. Okay. All right. Well, I would like to ask Mr. Scorsoni, um, in the past where we've had meetings, okay, he has discussed the revenue, anticipated revenue, and he's talked about due to the pandemic, there, we may have to, even after we pass a budget, a budget, more than likely we're going to have to amend that budget in the coming two, three months once we find out how the revenue changes uh, are affecting us. And um, part of the, you know, the areas that we know of would be state revenue sharing, um, Act 51 money, the street maintenance money, um, income tax, and payment of water and sewer bills. Could you give us an update, Mr. Scorsoni, on what you're seeing, what the trend is currently? Sure. Um, so I'll start with property taxes. Um, we don't see any major changes in property taxes at this time. Um, we may in the future, but I think as of tax collections this summer, there may be some increased delinquencies, but you know, we generally expect that to be pretty stable for the moment. Um, certainly taxable values won't be affected in the immediate term. Uh, as far as income tax, we, we are seeing a slight decline, although I have to say less than I would have expected for now, um, partially because I think, um, you know, the way our community's been structured. We just haven't seen, uh, you know, you, you would, you know, unemployment is obviously very high in the United States right now. Uh, we don't have local figures on unemployment because that's put out with a lag. Um, so we'll have to see if income taxes fall uh, further. Um, as far as uh, state revenue sharing, you know, that will be determined by the governor who is going to have to do a budget rescission in the next 30 days. But it, I also caution us because um, they've called for an August revenue uh, forecasting conference, which is extremely unusual. So my guess is because of the delays in the state income tax collection, in fact, our own income tax collections are also delayed. You know, we won't have a great idea of everything until August. Um, gas taxes are down. People are driving less. So we will have that impact um, isolated to the major street fund and local street fund. Um, water and sewer revenues, as I've told you before, are down, although actually they were up a little bit so far in May. Not up, but not as down as they were. Um, that could be because of stimulus checks or some other factors, perhaps. Um, but they're still down. On average, our collection rate is more towards 75-80% still at this time. Um, so basically, you know, the revenues are down, uh, but we were doing a little better than we would have thought, let's say up to March. So we have a little bit of cushion to get through this fiscal year, which is another five weeks roughly. Um, and then, I, you know, as far as 2021, we're just going to have to wait and see. And I don't think we'll have a clear picture until July, August, honestly, as to where our revenues are likely to be. Um, we, we take it very, you know, I think the mayor takes it very seriously, the use of fund balance. Uh, we understand that's a serious decision to be made, um, but we also believe it costs, you know, what we provide you is what it costs to run the city. And so we want to balance those things. 
Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, who's speaking? Is, oh, okay, I think that's just background. Um, could I ask you, please, what are the ramifications for the city if we don't use fund balance? So, if we pass a budget, uh, so if we um, do not use fund balance, which is the 14, 15 million in that range, um, that would have serious consequences, unfortunately. Um, so if you think about our budget, and I'm talking mostly general fund at the moment, that's $72 million. Of that $72 million, $20 million roughly is pension costs, and then another, say, let's just say roughly 10, 10 to $12 million is retiree health care. So those are what we would call fixed costs in accounting or economics. And so those costs we have to pay, no matter whether we – have one employee or 500 employees. Um, so if you think about that 72 million, 30 some million is a fixed cost. The other 40 million is is a you know a variable cost essentially. So we would have to cut 15 million out of the 40 million. So that's you know 40 percent roughly. So um, and the other factor is. 75% of the general fund is labor costs. So, you know, that would mean a significant reduction in, in employment, basically. Now, how that's done and, and how those cuts occur, you know, I, I can't really speculate on. Um, that's obviously a decision for, for the elected officials to decide on. But, um, but I just kind of give you a sense of the numbers it's 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 a very daunting number, I understand, but that's the reality. We we have fixed costs we're going to have to pay, um, and then we have a variable costs, and that's the only cost we could really look at in terms of reductions. So as I think I presented last time, we have about 250 employees in the general fund, uh, funded by the general fund. So you would have to look at reductions in those areas. And, um, and I, I will say this because I work with a lot of municipalities in the state. You know, Flint has cut a lot of people, a lot of services over time. Uh, there are other municipalities that have more flexibility, I would say, in terms of what changes they could make in these cases. Um, whereas I think Flint has much more uh, already done a lot of that. So it would be very difficult. Um, and, I don't, you know, again, I can't say – you would have to all decide on what the details of that looks like, but that's that's kind of what it would look like in general. So essentially, we'd be looking at staffing cuts. I mean, the reality is you team? have to, yeah, you couldn't cut. I mean, even if you eliminated professional services supplies, um, you know, and we need some of those things. I mean, some of those things are critical. For example. Our income tax collection is, is a professional service contract, um, you know, so you can't you can't cut all of that stuff and still run the city. So, yeah, you would have to cut some. You could cut some of those supplies and other costs, but you would absolutely have to cut labor costs as well, absolutely to a large to a, a very large extent. And and as we know, I mean, uh, as the chiefs have already laid out, police and fire. Are, you know, uh, we could eliminate those open positions, but we're already down in numbers substantially. I mean, Flint, by every measure of, of sort of objective measures of police and fire staffing, is already below where we need to be, even if we fill all these open positions. So you would be looking at a minimum of, of probably eliminating all those open positions and probably potentially more as well. Because, again, it's not just labor costs that are the majority of the cost. Police and fire are the majority of that. So um, if you just did a proportionate cut, you know, you would you get significant reductions in staffing. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, would uh, any other council people like to comment or ask questions, et cetera? 
Anyone? Yes. Miss Fields? Mr. Davis. Miss Fields. Yes, thank you for yeah, the dog. Well, listen to Mr. Uh, Scorsoni. Friend, we lean as we could be. You know, I don't see why, how some people interpret this as being, let me use the word, uh, in the green, if you will, or in the black. We we got to pay attention to every dime that come in and out the city. We're not we're not favorable by no means. We we really need to pay attention. We, police and fire is running at a minimum. Our legacy costs is through the roof. We got to have all hands in, on deck as well as all minds. I wish our council fires, our body council we we'll pay attention to this where we get on one accord and we work as diligent as the administration to try to correct some of these, these issues we have. Else we're in a world of trouble. Unless I'm just interpreting it wrong. I'm listening thoroughly and I'm listening to the, the actual numbers. We got to we got to button down. This is not a nothing to be laughing and playing games with. We really must start paying attention immediately. Thank you for indulging, Ms. Fields. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Any other council person? Anyone? Is there any uh, concluding remarks the administration would like to make? Mr. Edwards? Well, I would just, you know, I, I would just conclude by saying that, uh, you know, a lot of work has gone into the budget. Um, obviously, uh, no budget will be satisfying to all, but it's just a matter of, uh, every effort was taken in this particular budget to ensure um, that the that the city would function properly, move forward properly, that the city would have uh, the right kinds of services, people would uh, maintain jobs, and that um, the citizens would benefit from the fact that they would see city government operating at least at the same level that it has been for the, the, the past year. Or so. Uh, so every every um, every consideration was taken. Um, every department, uh, all the various aspects of department, uh, all the nuances and things that we felt like um, were important uh, were under consideration. But ultimately, when this budget was finally crafted, presented to council, um, as Mr. Scorsoni pointed out on on a couple occasions, uh, there were oversights. Uh, but those oversights ultimately, um, uh, you know, as as you pointed out, Kate, it has to either come from somewhere or it's going to push the number up even higher. Uh, so everything is done to try to um, keep the budget uh, in alignment, as I said, with the kinds of services, not trying to shortchange the citizens, not trying to reduce anything. But as has been pointed out, even as, even as um, the budget number that you see, uh, is evident. Um, there's also new positions that have not been filled as a part of it. Uh, some have been cut out. Some parts have been cut out of the budget to keep it around the you know the number that we're at. So uh, you know it, no, it's no question. Council has a ha, council has a powerful job uh, in looking at this and uh, examining and making some determinations. Uh, you know how much leaner can this budget get, and before before it uh, passes a point at which um, we're unable to function properly. So um, there, there's a tall task, and no question about it. We've tried to give you at least uh, we've tried to scope something that council could work with and make some determinations. It is the mayor's. Um, it is the mayor's uh, uh, sentiment that um, we're able to move forward with this particular budget so that we may not uh, even venture down the road of talking or having discussions about layoffs or other kinds of cuts. So we presented to you uh, a good budget based on maintaining the level of services that citizens deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Well, if there are no other comments from anyone, I would like to thank you all for a very, uh, in the main, professional meeting. And uh, 
I'd like to applaud everybody for really staying on task and on topic. And uh, any further uh, questions, I guess, can come up at the next council meeting on May 26th, which will be a regular meeting with regular rules. Uh, we're not having committee meetings um, in order to reduce the labor intensive things that have to happen, which unfortunately expose our staffing. So, uh, council will have, you know, upon reflection, you will have an opportunity, uh, for more questions. Um, but if you have anything you'd like to submit to me in writing, I will then pass it along quickly to the administration and ask for written responses prior to the May 26th meeting. And we will be also having a uh, meeting on uh, June 1st, which is a Monday, um, according to city charter, to adopt a budget. So on that note, I'd like to say we're actually at 6.56. I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you all.